Hey, welcome to the Catalyst Church Online Campus. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. If you are here for the very first time, I'd like to welcome you. We appreciate having you come and study with us today. We have a connection team here at Catalyst Church. They would love to help you connect with our community. If you wouldn't mind, take a moment. Let us know that you're here today. There should be some instructions on your screen how to do that. And if you're joining us on YouTube, take a moment also, click that subscribe button. That way you can join us each week as we upload new studies here on the Catalyst Church online campus. I also want to thank you for your continued generous, faithful giving to the ministries of Catalyst Church. At any time, you can give securely using our online giving platform. I want to take a moment also and ask for the Lord's blessings over the tithes and offerings this week. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, your love. We thank you for your provision. You give to us without end. And Lord, you have asked of us to return to you that first 10% of our produce, of our income. And so, Lord, we do. We give that tithe. We give it cheerfully. We give it gladly with thanksgiving. Lord, you've asked for the offerings above and beyond the tithe, and we give those as well, as your Spirit leads us. So, Lord, would you receive from us today? Leverage everything we give into stories of transformation. And Father, I pray unashamedly for your hand of blessing to be upon those who give today. In your name, amen. Amen. Well, you know, we live in an age of truly marvelous innovation, invention. Every week there's some new thing discovered or announced, and, and by the following week it seems we've already adopted it and adapted it into our lives. Last Tuesday there was a, a citywide outage of the internet for a couple hours here in Colfax. And I was sitting in my office working when it occurred. And actually, I was on my computer and on the internet. That's how I noticed it precisely when it happened. What struck me about this was my immediate reaction. And I have to give you a little backstory. I have developed a somewhat regimented weekly routine. It's not perfect, and I don't stick to it, you know, religiously. But I do certain tasks at certain times for the most part. That's kind of how I stay on top of things. They'll get behind. Well, when the internet outage occurred, I was in the middle of a, a you know computer dependent task, and once I found out that the issue wasn't you know local to our network or our router, my computer, that it was citywide at least, I actually froze for several moments. Well, now what am I supposed to do? It literally, I laugh at this now. I it literally took me several moments to realize it was okay for me to pivot to some other non-internet related task. I know it's re completely ridiculous, but it shows how dependent we can become. Even someone as myself, you know, who ostensibly dislikes most digital technology. And sometimes I think we adopt things without fully grasping the long-term repercussions. I brought with me today a small example of one of our modern era's most dangerous things. So dangerous, it threatens to destroy the very fabric of our society. By itself, it, it's rather innocuous. It, it's such a common and unremarkable thing as to hardly merit notice. It is, however, subtly transforming almost every aspect of our lives. And it has already inflicted untold damage in communities across our nation. What could this thing be? There it is. A package from Amazon. Now, why is an Amazon box so dangerous? Because for the first time in human history, you and I may now acquire virtually anything we need or want or desire without ever actually interacting with another human being. We could search for, compare, select, order, pay for, have delivered, receive, whatever we wish without leaving the comfort of our couch. Now hear me carefully, I'm not anti-convenience. See, the problem that this represents is 
we no longer need one another the way we used to. We no longer must engage in seemingly mundane tasks the way we once did. I can be an utter jerk and still survive. You can be a total misanthrope and not suffer materially. I don't have to accommodate you. You aren't required to be civil or mature or even respectful to me, to anyone else. We can click and our needs are met without the inconvenience or the hassle of others. This box represents a threat, a threat to our second core purpose here at Catalyst Church, belong. Let me set this aside. The biblical mandate for the church, traditionally referred to as fellowship, is the core concept of spiritual community. Throughout the ages, from the very birth of Christ's church, believers have been inspired and challenged by the example found in the book of Acts in the New Testament. Turn with me if you would. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 talking about the the first group of believers in Jerusalem, in and around Jerusalem. Verse 42 of chapter 2 in the book of Acts, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. It's a powerful imagery of harmony. And for just as long, the enemy of our souls has attacked the very concept of spiritual community, doing anything and everything to damage and undermine God's design for his people, living in an interdependent harmony. You know, for you and I as 21st century Americans, the enemy's most successful endeavor to this end was the birth of Jeffrey Bezos and Amazon. No, I'm just kidding. The enemy's most successful effort has been to instill in us the false nobility of independence. American culture is unique. Unique in that we are a nation founded entirely upon ideals, principles, words. This dependence upon words has a subtle danger inherent to it, though. It requires that we periodically wrestle amongst ourselves over the meaning of those words and, and, and the reach of the principles they engender. Christ followers share a uniquely similar but also potentially conflicting culture. We, too, overtly depend on upon words for our definition and our direction, the words of God, revealed to us in the word of God. And some of our words, some of the words of our national civic identity, align with the words of God, but not all, and not always smoothly. So Christ's followers must decide which set of words take precedence in those areas, in those inf incidents in which there is conflict. Do we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Or do we hold that all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work? Which of those do we hold? That second is Second Timothy chapter 3. Verse 16 and 17, the first one I quoted is the first main paragraph of our Declaration of Independence. Can these two beliefs be held in concert with one another? Are they equally true? Are they equally authoritative? Does one hold precedence over the other? And if so, which? You know, switching gears, I guess, a little bit, but not too much. 
there's a legitimate reason for an epidemiological laboratory to keep samples of anthrax on hand, but only if they can also ensure its containment. When it comes to this term, independence, We've allowed the, the summer interns from the local high school to play in the room where the anthrax is stored, and they've spilled it all over everything. The independence our founding fathers envisioned, claimed, wrestled, fought, and died over was for the collective liberty of a people, not the independent self-reliance of the individual to live and do without restraint. Independence at the heart of a nation opens the door to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Independence in the heart of an individual leads to eating forbidden fruit, exile, enslavement to sin, and subservience to death. Write this down. Spend some time in quiet contemplation of it. I'll repeat it a couple times so you have a chance to do so. The end point to the pursuit of independence is not liberty, it is enslavement. The end point to the pursuit of independence is not liberty, it is enslavement. You see, the demon, demon of independence has duped mankind into a supposedly noble yet utterly opposing pursuit to that which God intends. God intends an increasing dependence upon him and an increasing interdependence upon one another. Do you believe that the, the Holy Spirit, this is shifting gears, I guess, but do you believe that the Holy Spirit uses seemingly innocuous everyday instances to prophetically get our attention? I do. I also now believe in the power of prophetic irony. I have used this illustration of, of this Amazon package to show how you know, disjointed, fragmented we've allowed ourselves to become, but it took me a while to realize the truly ridiculous irony involved in this particular illustration. See, I didn't share with you what it was that I had ordered and that arrived in this package. I'll unpack this box for you, but I am going to let the Holy Spirit unpack the irony of it all. a new American flag for one of our campuses. And yes, it was made in America. I, had, I made sure to get one that was actually from an American company manufactured by Americans in America. And I had to pay almost three times as much for it, but that's fine. This is what came in the package that I'm using to show the fragmentation of independence. We'll let the Holy Spirit deal with that <laughs> on a different day, I guess. Let's talk about, though, the true nobility of belonging. So instead of unpacking the irony of that, let's spend, some, let's spend our time unpacking God's true design for spiritual community. And it is the true nobility of belonging. Our core purpose of belong is defined as such. Every one of us desires to be part of a community to experience what it means to play a vital role in the lives of others. We all seek and need to belong. That's our Catalyst Church core purpose of belonging. We were designed and crafted to live together, to do life together, to function best when it's in harmony with one another. We crave connection. We depend upon connection, even more than we sometimes realize. You have to know the fragmentation, the disconnection brought on by the, the COVID pande pandemic and the COVID hysteria will last long after the disease itself fades into history. And just as the enemy has his tools for fragmenting our belonging, God has his weapons for defending those attacks. And more important than mere defense, God has offensive weapons as well. But the target of his offense is not the enemy. His target is the disease of self-reliance in our own hearts. 
Spiritual community is God's subversively secret weapon for combating our pervasively flaunted fantasy of self-reliance. You and I, we can make three decisions that will contribute to belonging. The first is that we decide to engage. Decide to engage. The secret to vital community is not in merely gathering together. It is in choosing to love those we gather with. Creating opportunities to gather together is a good, necessary component. However, unless those gatherers, those who do the gathering, decide to engage truly with the community, little more is accomplished than the filling of schedules. And if we persist in this pattern, and those whom we are meant to love become those we resent for the imposition upon our time, consider the example Mary and Martha when Jesus came to visit their home. New Testament Gospel of Luke, back just a little bit from where we were in Acts. Chapter 10 of, of Luke, let's pick it up at verse 38. While they were traveling, he, Jesus, entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who also sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. And she came up and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve all alone? So tell her to give me a hand. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice, and it will not be taken away from her. See, Martha chose busyness over belonging. And though Mary began as the target, Martha's resentment soon spilled over to include a resentment against Jesus. Look there at verse 40, the last piece of, of verse 40. Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So tell her to give me a hand. Lord, don't you care? Like now all of a sudden, it's Jesus' fault. Martha's Self-absorption is clear in her final statement. You know, so tell her to give me a hand. It's all about Martha. You know, without actively maturing in Christ-likeness, you and I, we have little choice but to become manipulative and abusive towards one another, towards ourselves. Mistrust grows where attachment to Jesus and his ways wanes. Had Jesus not confronted Martha's resentment, she would have spiraled further into becoming a resentful, manipulative, dangerously self-righteous woman. I'm sure of it. I've seen it happen. We decide to engage. The second decision we make is that we decide to enjoy. Decide to enjoy. Surrender to God's design for community is the defining characteristic of spiritual community. Willingly laying aside our own agendas, our own thinking and strategies, our own plans in preference to His. When we choose to love one another, which is ostensibly the harder path, we're choosing against the enemy's efforts. And we are choosing for God's design. And we are the ones who derive the benefit. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, The person who loves their dream of community will destroy community. But the person who loves those around them will create community. Illustrating it a little differently, author Annie Dillard writes, A jigsaw puzzle piece can know only its neighbors and is in no position to comment on the rest of the puzzle. Think about that one for a minute. The puzzle can only make sense when each piece rests in its proper place next to the pieces it was created to mesh with and live alongside. If we trust that God knows what he is doing, that he has the final beautiful picture already in mind, we can find our peace and our fulfillment 
and allow the pieces alongside us to be exactly who God created them to be. Their difference from us does not threaten us. It enhances us. Our difference from them does not threaten them. We decide to enjoy. And the last decision that we make for belonging is we decide to expand. Living in community forces an expansion of awareness and an increase in understanding the condition, the, the story, the plight sometimes of others. Only through remaining purposefully ignorant, purposefully oblivious, could it be otherwise. Proverbs chapter 24. Oh, let's go with verse 10. Start there. If you do not... If you do nothing in a difficult time, your strength is limited. Rescue those being taken off to death and save those stumbling towards slaughter. If you say, but we didn't know about this, won't he who weighs hearts consider it? Won't he who protects your life know? Won't he repay a person according to his work? By implication there, it's not just that God will repay a person according to their work, He'll also repay them according to their avoiding. But didn't we didn't know about this? It's almost as if God says, I don't care. You could have known. And the context here is dealing with, you know, maybe helping with you know compassionately in a difficult time. And not everything in our life, not everything in community is that. But could we apply the principle in less strenuous terms? That we have a responsibility to expand our awareness to other people, not purposefully remain ignorant. We have a responsibility to engage. We have a responsibility to enjoy. We have a responsibility to expand in spiritual community. G.K. Chesterton wrote, Thinking in isolation and with pride ends in being an idiot. Every man who will not have softening of the heart must at least have softening of the brain. Community requires sacrifice, requires commitment of our time, our talent, our treasure. In this 2023 year of rhythm, let me challenge you. Creating new rhythms of belonging will not happen without making room for them. A nice way of saying, quit doing something else. Maybe I'll meddle for a minute. Quit watching TV and movies and videos. Make time for other people. Quit faking community on social media. Actually talk to them. Quit playing Candy Farm Bubble Crush on your phone. Quit making excuses for being self-absorbed and Selfishly self-centric, quit choosing fear. The heart of inaction is self-absorption. Fear is so often how we disguise the selfish impulse to do nothing. Your belonging is not something that the church does for its membership. The leadership of Catalyst Church may create opportunities for gathering some regular, you know, like Sundays or some periodic or regular or notable special events, but we cannot make belonging. Each person chooses that. And also, no one entering into our community can bring belonging with them. It must be offered by those already here. It must be part that's offered to them. Yeah, of course, some individuals are more open. They're more gregarious. But those are personality traits. That's not belonging. See, there can be only one reason that God allows us to live after we've come to a saving knowledge of Christ. Think about it. If our eternal fellowship with God is so important that he would send his son to be literally sacrificed to accomplish it, then once our salvation is accomplished in each of our lives, why risk us giving in to our fickleness and forsaking him? Why not just zap us home to heaven once we've surrendered to Christ? Well, the only reason is this. God wants more people in his kingdom more people to experience the belonging of eternity with him and the belonging on this side of eternity. He wants more. 
we are his tools for expanding his community. We decide to engage, we decide to enjoy, we decide to expand. We choose belonging. Belonging for ourselves by offering belonging to one another and by offering belonging to everyone that God brings across our path. That's why belong is a core purpose of Catalyst Church. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your grace in welcoming each and every one of us into your family. I thank you for those who have been a part of our family for years, decades even. I thank you for those who have been a part of our family for days. Each brings their own unique giftedness, their own unique handcrafted poema, work of art. Each brings their flavor, each brings their own fingerprints and leaves them upon the lives of everyone else. That is your design. And Holy Spirit, as you continue to bring more and more into a saving knowledge of Christ, as you bring more and more people into our own spiritual community known as Catalyst Church, we praise you for that, and we ask that you would grant us the courage to move against our fear and to offer belonging. Let each of us individually choose, make a decision to engage, a decision to enjoy, and a decision to expand. And Lord Jesus, let us be as welcoming as you, as gracious as you, as we offer belonging to all those whom, for whom you have died, and to all those whom you bring into our midst. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, on behalf of our entire Catalyst Church family, I want to thank you taking the time to engage with God's Word today. I do hope that you are blessed by these times. I hope the Spirit of God uses them to grow us each further into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. May the Lord richly bless your week ahead as you follow and trust Him. God bless you.